welcome age of vintage society. Susan Cabot came to a bad end, beaten to death by her son in their shabby San Fernando Valley home. Her macabre death was to tabloid journalism what table scraps are to starving dogs. The sheer Hollywood Babylon vibe of Cabot's death was a godsend for sleazy news merchants, and only partly because of her long career in B-movies. What made Susan Cabot's son to kill her? Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Susan Cabot, The Strange Case of the Wasp Woman Susan Cabot was a 1950s B-movie actress. She starred in many movies throughout her years. Not long after this movie, Cabot retired from the business and faded away into the shadows. Living with her only child, 22-year-old son Timothy Scott Roman, she became a recluse, suffering from suicidal thoughts and irrational fears. As time went on, she became increasingly unable to care for herself. Her house was so littered with trash and food, she was considered a hoarder. The early press coverage depicted Cabot as a Norma Desmond type, living in filth and prone to mental breakdowns. But the real story was Timothy, a 23-year-old son. To combat his dwarfism, Cabot had him placed on an experimental growth cure that involved hormones taken from human cadavers, a process later discontinued because of a link to neurological disorders. After 15 years of treatments, Timothy ended up a 5-foot-4-inch man-child known for mood swings. One night in December 1986, he used a weightlifting bar to bash his mother's head in. Her tragic life trajectory is one for the record books. Susan Cabot, aka Wasp Woman, was an actress who was best known for her role as Wasp Woman in the film of the same title. She made her film debut in 1947, by chance when Kiss of Death was filmed in New York and she played a bit part. She expanded her acting work into television and was seen by a Hollywood talent scout who took her to Hollywood to work for Columbia Pictures. This brief period was not successful and she moved to Universal Studios where she signed to an exclusive contract. After a series of roles with Cabot played mainly in B-Western films, she grew frustrated and asked to be released from her contract. She moved back to New York where she resumed her stage career with a role in A Stone for Danny Fisher. She was invited to return to Hollywood and appeared in a few more films, including The Wasp Woman in 1960, her final film role. Cabot was born Harriet Pearl Shapiro on July 9, 1927, to a Jewish family in Boston, Massachusetts. She led an early life filled with turmoil. After her father abandoned their family, Cabot's mother Elizabeth was institutionalised, leaving Cabot orphaned. She was subsequently raised in eight different foster homes and stated that she spent much of her childhood in the Bronx. It was posthumously revealed that, while in foster care, Cabot suffered emotional abuse, which triggered intense post-traumatic stress disorder. She attended high school in Manhattan and found employment as an illustrator of children's books. She supplemented her income by working as a singer, performing at the Village Barn Club in Manhattan. She married her first husband, the artist Martin Sacker, on July 30, 1944 in Washington, D.C., while still a minor. Sacker was a childhood friend, and the marriage presented Cabot with an opportunity to leave foster care. Cabot made her film debut in 20th Century Fox's film noir, Kiss of Death, which was filmed in New York playing a bit part as a restaurant patron. She was subsequently spotted performing at the Village Barn by a talent scout for Columbia Pictures, who cast her in on the Isle of Samoa. This led to further Hollywood roles, with Cabot signing a contract with Universal Pictures. Her first film with the studio was the 1951 western Tomahawk. The same year Cabot divorced her husband, Saka, and was subsequently romantically linked with King Hussein of Jordan for several years but their relationship was not a coincidence. The CIA organised the first date between Susan Cabot and the King of Jordan in 1959 that led to their relationship, 
the classified documents show. The documents, from the investigation into the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, showed the CIA, in a bid to strengthen relations with Jordan, got an ex-FBI agent to arrange the meeting between King Hussein and Cabot. The pair hit it off at a dinner party in LA, arranged by Robert Mayhew, who would go on to become a powerful aide to tycoon Howard Hughes. Agents then rented a Long Island beach house for King Hussein as he continued his state visit and arranged for Cabot to stay at a nearby hotel in New York. She was dragged into the CIA operation when former FBI agent Mayhew, who was a cleared CIA Office of Security contact, was asked to find female companionship during the official state visit of a foreign head of state in April 1959, according to the CIA memo. Susan Cabot was a major movie star in the 1950s. She appeared as a lead in a series of roles in similar Western and Arabian-themed films, such as The Battle at Apache Pass and The Duel at Silver Creek and Son of Ali Baba. In 1953, she starred in a further two Westerns, Gunsmoke and Ride Clear of Diablo. Dissatisfied with her film offers, Cabot asked to be released from her contract in 1954. She returned to New York and resumed her stage career with a role in a Leonard Cantor-directed Washington, D.C.-based production of Harold Robbins's A Stone for Danny Fisher. Cabot studied acting with Sanford Meisner in New York and continued to pursue a stage career, appearing in a short-lived run of the musical Shangri-La in Boston in 1959. She returned to Los Angeles and resumed a film career in the latter part of the 1950s, appearing in a series of films for Roger Corman, Carnival Rock, Sorority Girl, The Viking Women and the Sea Serpent, War of the Satellites and Machine Gun Kelly. The same year she had a lead role in the Western Fort Massacre opposite Joel McRae. Cabot's final film role was in Corman's horror film The Wasp Woman. Speaking on her work with Corman, Cabot recalled it as totally mad. It was like a European movie though she stated that Corman was some kind of maverick. He's very bright and fast thinking. In 1968, she married second husband Michael Roman, with whom she had one son, Timothy Scott Roman, before divorcing in 1983. Timothy suffered from dwarfism and other issues. Another contemporary actor, Christopher Jones, also claims paternity of her son, because Cabot was also romantically linked with King Hussein of Jordan for several years. Some said he was the father. Eventually Cabot moved back to LA. She lived with her dwarf son. In the last years of her life, Cabot suffered from depression and suicidal thoughts and was prey to a wide range of irrational, powerful fears. She was under a licensed psychologist's care, but the psychologist found her so troubled and ill that the sessions became emotionally draining. Cabot became increasingly unable to care for herself. The interior of her home was littered with years of trash and spoiled food lay everywhere. In late 1986, Cabot's mental health deteriorated significantly. Despite the squalor of the home's interior, Cabot still maintained an adequate income despite having retired from acting, largely due to real estate investments and her fascination with vintage cars which she regularly acquired, restored and resold. They lived in Encino in December of 1986 when she was found bludgeoned to death in his room. Timothy beat her with a weightlifting bar. 10th of December 1986, police were called to Cabot's home where her son informed them someone had broken into the house, knocked him unconscious, then attacked and killed his mother. He gave the description of a Latino man with curly hair whom was dressed in ninja garb and who had fled with $70,000. He claimed to have fought the ninja until the man knocked him unconscious. Unfortunately for Timothy, he lacked any head wounds that could prove this attack. His wounds, however, did seem to be suspiciously self-inflicted. When the police entered Susan's room, they found a bloodbath. She was found lying on her bed with blood splatter from floor to ceiling. The killer had covered her face with bed linen the police suspected Timothy to be the killer, took him to the station for interrogation. His statements became increasingly inconsistent, and soon he admitted his guilt and claimed insanity. His lawyers told a story of his controlling mother 
who after losing any sense of fame, became increasingly bitter and uncontrollably insane. He was charged with second-degree murder. At trial, Roman testified that his mother had awakened him while screaming, not recognising him, and calling for her mother, Elizabeth. When he attempted to call emergency services, she attacked him with a barbell bar and a scalpel. Roman seized the bar from her and beat her repeatedly on the head. He then hid the bar and scalpel. Cabot was found with her brains bashed out with a weight-lifting bar and no defensive wounds. Roman's defence attorneys claimed their client's aggressive reaction to his mother's attack was due to the drugs he took to counteract his dwarfism and pituitary gland problems as part of his treatments for his Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. Roman was treated for 15 years with an experimental hormone that later was discontinued when it was linked to neurological disorders in some patients, the court records showed. Smith in court papers said the mother and son had lived alone for several years in massive filth and decay. Photos showing clothing, bags of garbage, stacks of newspapers and magazines and other items piled high and strewn about. Every room photographed shows a high degree of disarray. The term hoarder had not been invented yet, apparently. His legal defence claimed the growth of treatments had affected Timothy's mind and ongoing tensions with his neurotic mother had driven him to violence. In the end, Timothy was charged with involuntary manslaughter and received a laughably light punishment, three years probation. A neighbour said that the two were very, very close. She never went any place without him. Another said she was different. When police attempted to enter Timothy's room, they were repelled by four large Akita dogs who had to be removed by animal control. Later, Timothy confessed to the crime, claiming she deserved it due to her possessive, controlling, overbearing nature. I'll leave it to your imagination what went on between them for eleven years. The judge said that Roman and his mother both had physical and emotional problems that may have contributed to the slaying. His attorney said, Mr. Roman is probably really an experiment of the human race, besides the steroids he continues to take today. Rumours say the relationship went on for a number of years and Cabot gave birth to a son who it is thought Hussein fathered. If he did indeed father Timothy, it would have been during Hussein's marriage to his second wife, Antoinette Gardiner, who he was married to from 1961 to 1971. During his trial, it was shown that Cabot was still receiving $1,500 a month from Hussein. There is written indication in the handwriting of Susan Roman this money is from a trust. For better or worse, it looks like child support, the lawyer wrote. But the Jordanian government, the Times reported, declined to comment on the claims about Roman's paternity. The strange case not only provided fodder for news columns and cheesy shows like Current Affair, but also created morbid interest in one of Cabot's movies, a 1959 Roger Corman feature called The Wasp Woman. In it, she played the ageing owner of a cosmetics firm who restores her youth with a serum taken from wasps. The formula has only one side effect. She turns into a wasp creature with an insatiable hunger for victims. The Wasp Woman was one of Cabot's final roles, ending her career not with a bang, but with a buzz. Timothy Roman Scott died on January 22, 2003 of heart failure. Susan Cabot died on this day in 1986. She was 59. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you are new here. And if you want to support my work, please visit our Patreon page. It's interesting to think how little we knew and perhaps still know about mental health and how the mind works. What happened to Susan Cabot is probably one of the most tragic stories in Hollywood history, but still just the one of many. Watch this video and find out what did happen between Virginia Rapp and Fatty Arbuckle in Room 1219.